Welcome to the podcast of Living Faith Fellowship in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Now, you will hear Pastor Rich preach the sermon, Release the Murderer, from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. We pray that God will use this sermon to speak to you directly. And now, to Pastor Rich. So last week, the Atlanta First News had an article and they reported that a murder suspect was loose after being accidentally released, according to the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. Zion River Shaka, 30 years old, was booked into Fulton County since 2020 and he faced several charges out of Clayton County. Shaka was supposed to be returned to jail on January 22nd after a hearing, but the Clayton County Sheriff's Office mistakenly let him go. And Fulton County was not too happy about that. And so Fulton County said they are looking for Shaka today. I read that article and I thought, when I hear of a murder suspect accidentally being let go, that's frustrating to me. Human error, that frustrates me. But what if they released a murderer on purpose and they ended up executing an innocent man instead? Would that frustrate you? Think about that as you open your Bibles with me this morning to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, as we continue in that verse by verse study. Last time, really quickly, let's catch up. Remember, we learned about some atrocities that were happening during Peter's denial. Mark 14, 65, then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and say to him, prophesy. And we said being blindfolded made it almost impossible to flinch when the punches were coming and to guard against those punches. So the beating would have been that much more destructive to Jesus. Isaiah, remember we studied, told us that he was beaten so badly that you could barely tell that he was a human being at the time. And we learned how Peter lied. And then finally he cursed and swore that he didn't even know Jesus. Then remember, after the rooster crows, Peter looks over and Jesus is staring at him with eyes of compassion and love and not judgment or hate or anger. And then finally, we ended with kind of a relief of Peter's full restoration back into ministry. And so today we're going to learn about the false trials before Pilate and how the religious leaders ask for a murderer to be set free and that the innocent lamb of God be crucified. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one, Jesus's silence speaks volumes. If your Bibles are open, Mark 15, start at verse 1. It says, Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing so that Pilate marveled. So this is about 5 a.m. Jesus, remember, has already been beaten brutally at his last trial at the high priest's house. And the, the Sanhedrin gets together and they're trying to discern what they could do after they've beaten Jesus and now they want him crucified. And so they're trying to discern, what do we do? In other words, what legal avenue do we have to crucify the Messiah? You see, Rome was over Israel at this time. And one of their laws about capital punishment was that only Rome could impose capital punishment on somebody. So Pilate is the prefect or the governor, and he possessed great power. And his position in the empire is right up there in the top leadership. But he hated Judea. He hated the Jews. And he had zero concern over Judaism either. There in your notes. So the Sanhedrin sent Jesus to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor over Judea, to expedite Jesus' execution because they did not have the authority 
to put him to death. John 18, 31. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Here's my question. Why would Pilate, seeing how he hates the Jews, doesn't care about the religion, doesn't care about them at all, why would he even want to get involved with this mess? He's broken no Roman laws. This is what Carson said. Prefix governed small, troubled area. And in judicial matters, they possessed powers like those with far greater positions. In short, they held the power of life and death. So again, why didn't Pilate just tell the Sanhedrin, get lost? I want nothing to do with you guys. Well, there's actually really good reason why Pilate was willing to listen to this. Listen to these things there in your note. Pilate was in trouble with Tiberius Caesar because some of the things he had done while governing Judea. There are three specific things that caused a mess between Pilate and Caesar. Number one, when Pilate first came to Judea, his men were carrying standards of gold and silver with eagles on top of the standards. And the Jews considered that idolatry. And so they had an uprising because they thought that Pilate was coming in with idols into their town. So the Jews rioted and Pilate ordered all the rioters to be brought into the amphitheater and threatened to kill them. And so what did they do? The rioters all laid down and said, if you kill us, 10,000 more will come in and take our place. So Pilate ends up backing off because what are you going to do to these people? They'll just keep coming. And Tiberius Caesar hears that he could not handle the uprising and he threatened to remove Pilate. Number two, two years later, Pilate had an aqueduct built and he raided their temple, the Jewish temple, to pay for this aqueduct. And you can imagine, what did they do? They rioted again. Another rebellion. And again, Tiberius Caesar hears about this and he's furious. A second uprising. And then just a few months before our narrative here, Pilate ordered new shields for his soldiers. And on front of the shields was Tiberius Caesar. He's trying to please Caesar. And again, the Jews say, that's idolatry. How dare you bring that in here? They rioted again. Tiberius Caesar warned Pilate right then and there. If there's one more uprising from the Jews, I'll remove you as governor and I'll summon you back to Rome. And it probably wouldn't go real well if he got summoned back to Rome. What's so ironic is these Jews have broken every one of their own laws while trying Jesus. And they wanted to stone Jesus for themselves because they believe he's committed blasphemy. They believe he's taken over their position, but they didn't have the right to do it. They also didn't want to upset Jesus's followers there in your notes. So the religious leaders went to Pilate, who did not want to upset the Jewish leadership again for fear of another uprising. Pilate didn't care that Jesus claimed to be the son of God. In Pilate's mind, he just didn't care. But the religious leaders considered that blasphemy. So the religious leaders also accused Jesus of some other things because basically Pilate didn't care about, quote unquote, this blasphemy that he's done. So they accused Jesus of being a terrorist, starting an insurrection, promoting himself as king of the Jews, making himself over Caesar. And yet again, remember, only Rome had the right of the sword. Rome did allow certain of their territories to have a form of self-rule. But again, they held the power of taking a life. So Jesus wouldn't defend himself. He's before Pilate and Pilate says, are you king of the Jews? He said, yes. And then he starts to list these other charges. And Jesus is completely silent. And Pilate's perplexed. He's perplexed about this whole thing. Even though they didn't have the authority to kill people, they have killed people before, right? Think about this. In the narrative in John 8, the woman caught in the act of adultery and they're getting ready to stone her for adultery. Maybe you remember the story and Jesus stepped in. How about the first Christian martyr, Stephen? 
In Acts chapter 7, the Jews stoned Stephen to death. So there were times that the Jews used the death penalty, even though they didn't have the authority to do so. So here's my question. Why did the Jews stone certain people, yet they wanted the Romans to kill Jesus? Why is that? I would assert that the Romans did not kill Jesus alone. Okay, so many times we think it was Rome who killed Jesus or it was the Jews who killed Jesus. The Jews didn't want to take responsibility for his death. And they didn't kill him alone either. It was the will of the Father. It was a predetermined will of God the Father that Jesus would die. Number two, Jesus had to die by crucifixion in order to fulfill Old Testament prophecies. Number three, according to Mark 10, the Gentiles had to have their hands in his death. And the fourth and most important one is Jesus took the curse of sin. So in exchange, we could become the righteousness of God in him. Had Jesus not died on the cross, we would be dead in our sins and trespasses. Deuteronomy 21, 22. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Jesus became a curse so we could become the righteousness of God in him. There in your notes. This is my thought. The whole world participated in Jesus's death. But now because of Jesus's death, the whole world can receive forgiveness of sin if they will trust in the finished work of him on the cross. And so again, in verse two, it's real ironic. Pilate looks at Jesus and says, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, it's as you say. We're told in Luke 23, 1, the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and that he calls himself the Christ, a king. So in verse 2, the question, are you king of the Jews? He said, it's as you say. But then they start accusing him of all these other things, and Jesus remains silent. When he's questioned, he doesn't say a word. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. So they take Jesus to Pilate and they're accusing him of political treason, which is punishable by death, by the way. And this is why they're doing it because they know that Rome can kill him for treason. And so they accuse him of stirring up civil unrest and they accuse him of telling people not to pay their taxes. And then the final accusation, he calls himself the Christ. He's king even over Caesar. Jesus seems to be at Pilate's mercy here. Think about this. And I'm sure up to this point, Pilate has seen man after man after man beg for their life, right? If this guy has the power of life and death, just imagine all these people who were condemned to death coming before Pilate and saying, please have mercy on me. I'm throwing myself on your mercy. What man in his right mind would not beg for his life? William Lane said this. Such silence was wholly unusual in this forum and demonstrated a presence and a dignity that puzzled Pilate. It just absolutely puzzled him. John 19, 10. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. You have no power over me. This is going to happen. You might think you have the power. But this is the predetermined will of God the Father. And I'm allowing it. All right, so Roman numeral two, Pilate wanted to release Jesus. 
Pilate wanted to release Jesus. Look at verse six. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had, listen to what they've done, they had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he has always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. Remember, this is during the Passover. And Passover was the celebration of the exodus out of Egypt after four centuries of slavery. According to JSTOR Daily website, this is what it said. Over the century, different Passover traditions had come and gone, and some persisted longer than others. And the faintest traces of history could be found. But one such custom was the annual release of a prisoner. There in your notes. On the evening before every Passover during the Roman occupation of Jerusalem, Jewish leaders asked the Roman governor to free a single convict who likely had become a political prisoner. So during this time of Jesus, because Rome is over them, there's a lot of insurrections going on. A lot of men uprising against them and wanting to overthrow the Roman government. It's kind of like modern day terrorists. That's what's going on here. And this is exactly what the religious leaders said Jesus was doing. He's a modern day terrorist. So why would Pilate want to set Jesus free? That's a great question. Well, besides the tradition of setting a prisoner free, Pilate actually knew Jesus was innocent. And so I would say it's partly because of his conscience. Luke 23, 13 says this. Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I find no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. There in your notes. No, neither did Herod. For I sent you back to him and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. There in your notes. Pilate had a political problem. So he had to make a choice between doing what was right and doing what was politically easy. Again, Pilate is no fan of the Jews, but he knew that these religious leaders brought charges again before Caesar. He was going to be in trouble. And he also knew how popular Jesus was among the people. And so he said, you know, these religious leaders, the only reason they're going after Jesus is because of envy. They know full well he's innocent. In verse 7, we're introduced to this man named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. The Encyclopedia Britannica says this, Barabbas was a prisoner mentioned in all four Gospels, and he was chosen by the crowd over Jesus, that much we know, to be released by Pilate in a pardon. But Barabbas was called a notorious prisoner. In Mark 15, 7, he was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection against the Roman forces. John 18, 40 says that he was a bandit. Most commentators believe that Barabbas was the true insurrectionist in this story, wanting to overthrow Rome. Catch this. Most extra biblical historians say that he was the worst mass murderer of their time. Think about this. Think about who the worst mass murderer of our time would be and letting him go and crucifying an innocent man. That's what's happening here. He was even hated by his own people because every time he'd do an insurrection, every time he'd rise up against Rome, all the people had to pay the price of the consequence, not just him. He caused so much trouble by his actions so the people hated him. Do you know that the thieves on each side of Jesus on the morning he was crucified were actually insurrectionists as well? So here's Jesus being accused of insurrection. 
And he's an innocent man. Here's something else that I learned. Barabbas was actually scheduled to be crucified that day. Jesus literally and figuratively took his place. I think Pilate was trying to appeal to the crowd. You know he's an innocent man. Who do you want? Do you want Jesus or do you want this mass murderer who's caused you all these problems? Roman numeral three, the murderer was pardoned. Look at verse 11. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, what do you want me to do with him who you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out, crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, crucify him. The religious leaders are telling the crowd how to vote. You, you want to talk about peer pressure. These religious leaders, these people have to live with these guys. And these guys get to determine a lot of stuff for them. And they're telling this crowd how to vote. There in your notes, we must remember that most Jews didn't trust nor like Pilate. And most of them did not want to anger their own Jewish religious leaders. Now, the question's been asked several times. How does this crowd ask for Jesus to be crucified when a week earlier the crowd was shouting Hosanna on Palm Sunday? How did that happen? The triumphant entry, just a week later, they were Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet here, crucify, crucify. Remember, up to two to three million people came to Jerusalem for Passover. And again, it's the celebration of when the angel of death passed over all those homes that had the blood on the doorpost, celebrating the exodus out of Egypt. The crowd during Palm Sunday, again, they hear Jesus is coming to town and they start shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he. And they're calling him the king of the Jews. These people, remember, their whole lives have learned the messianic prophecies. And the one especially out of Psalm 118, Psalm 118, 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. See, Hosanna means save, rescue. Savior. And so it's no wonder why the religious establishment, when that happened that day on the triumphant entry, they wanted Jesus dead. And here we are a week later. And now the crowd saying the same thing. Here's my question. Was the crowd fickle? Or were they afraid of the religious leaders? Or was there another reason? There in your notes, as A.T. Robinson said, if one wonders why the crowd was fickle, he may recall that this was not yet the same people who followed him in the triumphant entry and into the temple. So his assertion is it's not even the same crowd. And I don't know if it is or not. But Pilate's dilemma is shown within his question. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? John MacArthur said this was a last ditch effort to escape the dilemma between the Sanhedrin or to do what's right with Rome. A conflict between his conscience and his career. A choice between satisfying the Jews who he hated or creating a problem with his boss. Why would a cruel Roman governor spend so much time trying to convince this crowd. Why would he do it? Was it because Pilate was impressed by how Jesus didn't try to defend himself? Was it because Pilate believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah? Was it to spite the Sanhedrin whom he hated? Was it all of the above? Or was it because he was trying to save his political life? There in your notes, not only did Pilate think Jesus was innocent, but his wife had a vision and told Pilate not to touch this innocent man. 
But Pilate does not want a political catastrophe on his hands. Matthew 27, 19, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with that just man, for I had suffered many things today in a dream because of him. So I guess we get to choose why Pilate was suffering. I don't know the answer, but I think it might be all of the above. Roman numeral four. So Pilate tried to appease his political foes. Look at verse 15. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus and had him scourged to be crucified. Remember, here Jesus is when he shows up at Pilate's place. He's been beaten so bad already, and he was spat upon and smacked with open palms and blindfolded and all those things. And here, during this trial, Pilate orders Jesus to be flogged before he's going to get crucified. The flogging by the Romans, they're known for being the worst in all of history. There in your notes, scourging was not meant to kill someone. However, it was brutal enough to be fatal. Scourging was meant to not only harm a person, but to humiliate them as well. They would strip a person and humiliate them publicly. And then the whip that they were using was a flagrum, is a cat of nine tails with strips of leather, with bones, pieces of bones and pieces of stone. And they would whip a person from their chest to their waist. This was graphic. But this was interesting to me. David McAllister said that Roman law actually mandated flogging as a part of a capital punishment. But it wasn't to hurt them more. He says it was to make their time on the cross even shorter. The victim would have been so weak and lost so much blood from the beating that they would die quicker on the cross. 800 years before this scene, Isaiah prophesied this, Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By law, Pilate had to have Jesus flogged before his crucifixion. But I wonder another thing, and this is just me wondering. I wonder when Pilate sent him to be flogged, if he was actually hoping that the religious leaders would relent after seeing him beaten so badly to say, okay, okay, enough. So let's get practical this morning. I started saying when we hear of a murder suspect being released on purpose and an innocent man being killed, that's frustrating. I mean, real frustrating. Think about the families of the victims of this murderer. And again, most secular historians tell us that Barabbas was one of the worst mass murderers of his time and his own people hated him because of all the consequences they were facing. Matthew 27 says that he was a notorious prisoner but I would call him a notorious sinner. But now the bad news part of this good news message. We're all murderers. We're all notorious sinners like Barabbas. And if you say, oh, not me, I lived a good life. Well, you you ought to go study the Sermon on the Mount sometime. Jesus said, if you've ever been angry with your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of us have been angry with somebody before? But Pilate was given a choice between Jesus and Caesar. Pilate had to choose between his place in this world and his place with Jesus. He had to choose between the power of the world or surrendering to Jesus. You know, Pilate desperately tried, like a lot of us, to have both. A good standing with Jesus and being a friend of Caesar. Don't we try that? I think every one of us try that. The bad news is you can never permanently keep 
anything that you've gained in this world by denying Jesus. Within 10 years of this very scene, Pilate lost his position as governor over Judea and was sent back to Rome. When he got there, back to Rome, Tiberius had died and the new Caesar that was in charge exiled him to Gaul and there he committed suicide. Pilate compromised everything he had during this trial of Jesus in order to secure his place in the world. Pilate, just like the religious leaders, chose the world and Caesar over Jesus, the real king of kings and lord of lords. You know, last week I said this, that Jesus was not the one on trial here. Think about this. Again today, Jesus is not the one on trial. The crowd, the religious leaders, and Pilate are the ones who are truly on trial here. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. See, like the crowd, we have a choice this morning, folks. <laughs> we can choose to be a friend of the world or a friend of Jesus. We cannot be both. And although we try, <laughs> we cannot be both. And the decision that you make determines your eternity. Choosing Jesus is a decision to flee from the consequence of sin, eternal loss and darkness and enter the light of Jesus Christ and gain eternal life. There in your notes, because of our sin, we were the murderers who escaped the penalty due us when we received the free gift of Jesus Christ, who is the innocent man who was executed on Calvary's cross. Think about the irony here for these Jews. Think about this for a minute. As an enemy of Rome, these Jewish religious leaders actually made themselves loyal subjects of Rome in order to get rid of Jesus in their life. In order for us to get rid of Jesus in our life, what do we, who do we line up with? What do we take on? Within less than 40 years of this narrative, Rome came in, destroyed Jerusalem, and destroyed the temple. The very temple, the very city that was promised through Abraham to be theirs forever. So for us this morning, here's our question. We go out of here. And I mean, yes, we live in a world. <laughs> we have to have jobs. We have to do certain things. We have to do work till he comes, he told us. But here it is. Are you a friend of the world are you a friend of Jesus? He who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my father's in heaven. He who denies me before men, I will deny him before my father in heaven. Who are you a friend to this morning? That's the question. And Jesus, because of his great love, would look at us like he looked at Peter with these eyes of compassion and forgiveness and love. And he would say, Come, take my burden. It's light and easy. I love you. I've given you everything. And so many times we think that the world has something we need rather than taking the light burden of Jesus Christ in receiving eternal life. This morning, if you're trying to earn favor with the world and you somehow are denying Christ by the way you're living or the compromise that you're giving into, the priorities you're choosing over Jesus, what does that look like for us this morning? And we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But where are your priorities this morning? Whose friend are you? Thank you for listening to Pastor Rich preach the sermon, Release the Murderer, from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. Tune in next week as Pastor Rich preaches a topical message on baptism. Join us every Sunday morning, either in person at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. or online at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Watch our live stream on our website, YouTube, or Facebook page. Our website is livingfaithklamath.com. To find our Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram profile, simply search 
search for Living Faith Fellowship Klamath. You can also find these links in the description of this week's episode. All sermons are available on our website. Simply click on the Resources tab and then click on Sermons. If you want to show your appreciation, you can tell others about us, subscribe to our podcast, and you can also leave a review so more people can hear the Word of God. Thank you again, and God bless you.